This is Jonathan Hansen. I want to welcome you to the Warning television program. We're in a, li a li live, I should say, audience here at World Ministries International. Um, we're in our college chapel. And uh, we're talking about today great anointing and the power of a testimony. If you've been watching, you know that we've been talking on a series of these messages of anointing. We need a great anointing. We need a great awakening. The church, like never before, has to have these things if we are going to save America. Frankly, I believe the church is backslidden. It's lukewarm. They've relied on their own selves, their own vanity, their own mental uh, knowledge, and uh, uh, they, they haven't valued the Holy Spirit. And we're, we're losing America because of that. When Jesus ascended, he said, you must tarry. You can't do it in your own effort or your pride or your vanity. I must do it through you. But yet, people don't tarry for the baptism. So great anointing in the power of a testimony. America and the church needs another great awakening. The church is very sick. Most Christians no longer are capable to deal with the sin and tyranny sweeping America because they have become part of the problem in America. They have diluted and compromised the word of God to include sins of abomination, such as accepting or even ordaining homosexuals and lesbians as priests or pastors. These type of lukewarm Christians come to church but live in cohabitation with fornicators and adulterers. They watch every type of filthy movie, TV program, pornography on the internet or in magazines. These Christians are so far away from intimacy with God that they have no discernment and under a spirit of deceivableness, so they are gullible and obey the lies of the leader or political party that becomes a Hitler and the Nazis. They ignorantly and stupidly, cowardly, watch as the laws are changed, which are unconstitutional. They have no spirit of the line of Judah in them to criticize, disobey, or resist the tyranny taking place right in front of their eyes. They like the Jews and Christians in Europe and Germany who did not have the courage to be true ambassadors to speak against evil in every form, including policies and unconstitutional laws, or to flee when they had the time and warning to do so, instead became trapped, arrested, many rounded up, taken to concentration camps where millions died. They ignored the warnings. The men and women who led the first and second great awakening were totally in love with Christ. They were willing to deny themselves, family, friends, businesses, and careers in pursuit and in service of God. They wanted to be filled with the third person of the Trinity called the baptism of the Holy Ghost so they could obey the Great Commission and make disciples in their nation, heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise the dead. They wanted to truly be real ambassadors of Jesus Christ and were willing to tarry as commanded by the Lord when he ascended to obtain the power and authority needed to accomplish the task of being an ambassador. Today we're going to look at the life of Kerry Judd Montgomery, a real mover and shaker that was used in America's great awakening. Text Mark 12, 29 through 31. I've used some of these texts before. Why? Because that's what's needed for them, for you and I. Jesus answered the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Wow. If we could just do that, operate in love, we win. But the church is not in love. We're disunified. We hold grudges. We come bitter. We're in sin. Perfect love would not be engaged in deliberate sin. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus said and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Therefore, go and make disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There it is. He is with us. He is with us right now if the third person of the Trinity lives within you. He's moving through you. And you have power and authority. Luke 24, 47 through 53. And that repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God and blessing God. Wow. Continually in one accord. They obeyed. They went to tarry for the power they needed to accomplish what he told them to do, be an ambassador. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. There appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. One sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. You know, some people say, I've never seen this. Well, there's testimonies of people in different parts of the world that have seen this, very seen this with fire on top of people, including orphanages in China. Second Peter 1, 2 through 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as divine power is given to all of us that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you are partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Partakers of the divine nature. We can expect to move into that nature, the characteristics of Jesus Christ, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We should be changing, all of us, continually. Amen? I know a person, and I don't want to get too much into these type of testimonies, but I know a person who uh, 30 years ago was a cop, and still today he talks like a drunken cop that's angry and cursing, and I've told E.G., I, I have a hard time believing he's born again, because nothing has changed in his language. I have a hard time believing you're born again. Number one, it takes intense spiritual hunger to have encounters with God. Maria Judd Montgomery stated, now who is going to trust God for the winged life? The winged life. I like that. The, you know, uh, eagles, the winged life, soaring as eagles, eagles saving nations. You can crawl instead if you wish. God will even bless you if you crawl. <laughs> Listen to Maria. He will do the best he can for you, but oh, how much better to avail ourselves of our wonderful privileges in Christ and to mount up with wings as eagles. Run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Oh, beloved friends, there is a life on wings. I feel the streams of his life fill me, permeate my mortal frame from head to feet until no words are adequate to describe it. I can only make a few bungling attempts to tell you what it is like and ask the Lord to reveal to you the rest. May he reveal to you your inheritance in Jesus Christ so that you will press on and get all that he has for you. What a great statement and testimony. It takes believers who will press into the supernatural lifestyle made available for every follower of Jesus to reveal these aspects of God's nature. Maria's spiritual hunger led her on journeys where she experienced God's presence in profound ways. In other words, she was never satisfied. Point two, healing encounter. Maria grew up in an Episcopal church. At 17, she said God wanted her to surrender all to him. She told the Lord she was going to keep her talent for writing tight. But she told the Lord if he wanted, he could tear her hands apart. 
dangerous statement. Shortly after that, statement to God, while walking to school, she slipped and fell hard on the icy ground. Maria's injuries from the fall turned into a disease, which developed into tuberculosis of the spine and the blood. She was bedridden for two years with chronic pain. She could ev couldn't even handle touch, sound, or light. Her sisters had already died of different diseases, and now her mother had called the friends to say goodbye to her. Maria thought she had heard from God that she still had a mission to complete. Maria's father read about a person who gave a testimony of being healed, and the Judd family sent a letter to the woman mentioned in the article for prayer for his daughter. African-American healing evangelist Sarah Mix responded with a letter on February 24, 1879. Miss Carrie Judd, I received a line from your sister Eva stating your case, your disease, and your faith. I can encourage you by the word of God that according to your faith, so be it under you. Besides, you have this promise. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them up. Whether the person is present or absent, if it is a prayer of faith, it is all the same. God has promised to raise up the sick ones, and if they have committed sins, to forgive them. Now, this promise is to you as if you were the only living person. Now, if you can claim that promise, I have not the least bit doubt you will be healed. You will have to first lay aside all medicines of every description. Wow. Uh, a lot of people would fail right there. Use no rem remedies of any kind. Lay aside trusting in the arm of the flesh. Lean wholly upon God and his promises. When you receive this letter, I want you to begin to pray for faith. And Wednesday afternoon, the female prayer meeting is at our house. We will make you a subject of prayers between the hours of three and four. I want you to pray for yourself and pray believing and then act in faith. It makes no difference how you feel. Get out of bed. Begin to walk by faith. Strength will come, disease will depart, and you'll be made whole. We read in the gospel, thy faith has made thee whole. Right soon, yours in faith, Mrs. Edward Mix. Wow. I know some people that live that way. My grandmother, Letta, in China lived that way. Terry followed the instructions to the letter, prayed the prayer of faith found in James 5, got out of bed, and was healed. They had already called friends to say goodbye. Carrie's testimony was printed in the newspapers, and news of her healing spread as far as England. This happened during a time of uh, that the view in the church was that it's good to suffer even illness unto the Lord. Not many people at this time were praying and believing for healing, and her testimony of healing helped change the attitude of many. Again, the power of a testimony. Three, foundations of her life now laid. Her first foundation at 22 in 1880 was her writing and publications. She released a book called The Prayer of Faith. See, now she's writing for the Lord, which spread beyond the United States, translated into French, Dutch, German, and Swedish. Thousands of people were healed by reading the book. In 1881, Carrie stepped out in faith to produce a periodical on healing and holiness called Triumphs of Faith when she only had enough money to launch the first issue. Now catch this. She keeps stepping out of faith with barely enough money for one issue, and it continues. This monthly newsletter, Outlive Caring, became a significant vehicle for spreading healing testimonies, revival fires around the world, as well as empowering women in ministry. Wow. I've got women sitting here. Women God is going to use in ministry in tremendous ways. Four, her second foundation is shortly after her healing. She started an ecumenical preaching career and shared her testimony of healing at the local church. By 1883, she had already initiated Thursday night prayer meetings, Tuesday afternoon Bible studies, once a month prayer meetings for missionaries. Carrie would later speak at conferences, conventions, cap meetings, and she was one of the first itinerant women to preach across North America. Five, her foundation. The third one is when she opened Faith Sanctuary in 18, 
80 in a room in her house that was set aside to pray for the sick. In 1882, Carrie stepped out in faith to open one of the earliest healing homes in America, which she called Faith Rest Cottage, when she did not have enough money beyond the first few months. I like this. As she stepped out in faith, activation of anointing and resources came in. God speaks to us through testimonies, and every testimony brings something of heaven into the atmosphere. That's why I love testimonies. Clara used hers and other people's testimonies of healing to inspire, to activate their faith as God is no respecter of people. He shows no partiality. Acts 10, 44. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. 7. Hunger produces anointing, encounter. Carrie continued to have an unquenchable hunger for God. Her hunger for God caused her to know he wanted to get full control of her filling her temple, her body, her person, will, mind, and emotions. She, she heard of people further east who had great anointing and took a train to be with these people. In other words, she, you know, eagle saving nations, if you move with eagles and walk with eagles and talk with eagles, you become an eagle. She wanted to move with people of faith, not just stay back with, if you don't mind me saying, losers. People that didn't care if they walked in faith. You don't go anywhere with those people around you. After arriving at her sister's residence, she was advised by a motherly saint of God that her evening meal was about ready. Carrie said, oh, I do not want to eat anything. I want God. So she's willing to travel anywhere, and now she won't even eat until she gets what she's coming for. I'm making a point, people. God has got to be what you're after if you want great anointing. He's got to be your sole purpose. Carrie was left alone in her room waiting on God, and later this woman joined her. As they were together worshiping God, Worshiping God, God manifested himself in a cloud of heavenly dew, which descended gently upon my head and entered my being, taking full possession of me. At the same time, a sweet, restful feeling almost overpowered me so that my own strength somewhat left me. And I leaned over and rested my head upon this dear sister's shoulder. She traveled to be with these type of saints. While waiting on the Lord a few more days, this hallowed home, the manifestations of the Lord's presence about me and within me became still more glorious until my whole being seemed to be filled with rivers of living water. And Jesus himself revealed as the one among 10,000, the lily of the valley. So she wanted to be with these type of people and she would go anywhere to be with them. This encounter with God left a greater anointing in Carrie's life. This happened because she had put everything aside Gone on a journey with only God focused on. She would not even eat. She wanted more of God. In 1890, Carrie married businessman George Montgomery, who relocated her to Oakland, California. George had been healed under the ministry of John Alexander Dowie. In 1893, Carrie opened the first healing home on the West Coast called the Home of Peace, which is still open today. Carrie also started healing and revival meetings, orphanages, missionary training schools, and homes for the minorities. Eight, spirit baptism, encounters, speaking in tongues. The Azusa Street Revival, ignited by William J. Seymour, an African-American in early 1906, was known for people longing to be baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Carrie finally made it to a meeting and was impacted seeing a spirit-baptized girl shining in God's glory. Now, here she was constantly being filled with more and more and more of the presence of God, yet lacked speaking in tongues. Now she's going to do anything she can to get it. Carrie, in her words, I hate had myself received marvelous anointing of the Holy Spirit in the past, but felt if there was more for me, I surely wanted it. 
as I could not afford to miss any blessing that the Lord was pouring out in these days. I mean, what an attitude. I can't afford to miss any blessing. Some people would be content to sit on their laurels. Uh, look how I've been used of God. July 1907, one of Carrie's workers at the Home of Peace was baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. Then revival broke out among the children at her orphanage. They were speaking in tongues. Carrie wanted more because of these stirrings sought others to pray for her. This caused Carrie to want even more of God. So she took a trip back east to pray about the signs related to the Pentecostal revival. She met with friends in Cleveland, Ohio that spoke in tongues and urged them to pray with her. She wanted her tiny streams of the Spirit to burst into rivers of living water. She tried to go to meetings where people were tearing for the endowment of power from on high. At this time, Carrie was becoming more and more filled with the power, anointing, and Spirit of God, but was yet not able to speak in tongues. She returned to Chicago to reunite with Lucy E. Simmons, a close friend who had received the fullness of the Spirit with a sign of speaking in tongues. They spent some time tearing in the Lord's presence. Then something new happened to Carrie. She recorded the following account. On Monday, June 29, less than a week from the time I took my first stand by faith, the mighty outpouring came upon me. I had said, quote, I am under the blood and under oil. Unquote. I then began singing a little song. He gives me joy instead of sorrow. To my surprise, some of the words would stick in my throat. As though the muscles tightened and would not let me utter them. I tried several times with the same results. Mrs. Simmons remarked that she thought the Lord was taking away my English tongue because he wanted me to speak in other languages. I replied, well, he says in Mark 16, 17, they shall speak with new tongues, unquote. So I take that too by faith. In a few moments, I uttered a few scattered words in an unknown tongue and then burst into a language and came pouring out in great fluency and clearness. For nearly two hours, I spoke and sang in unknown tongues. There seemed to be three or four distinct languages. Some of the tunes were beautiful. Most were oriental. I tried sometimes to say something in English, but the effort caused such distress in my throat and head. I had to stop after a few words and go back to the unknown tongue. I was filled with joy and praise to God with an inward depth of satisfaction in him, which cannot be described. To be controlled by the spirit and to feel that he was speaking heavenly mysteries through me was most delightful. The rivers of living water flowed through me and divine ecstasy filled my soul. There was no shaking, no contortions of the body. I felt that I drank and used up the life and power as fast as it was poured into me. I became very weak physically under the greatness of the heavenly vision and staggered when I tried to walk across the floor. You know, I could give you so many testimonies of things like this. So many testimonies. People receiving heavenly visions under the power of God, slain in the spirit, trances. My daughter that became a missionary in Japan uh, couldn't speak Japanese. And then in a Japanese church, she was singing and praising God in perfect Japanese. She opened her eyes and the, and the people of, of the church, the Japanese people said, Talitha, I did not know you could speak in tongues. Or I should say, speak in Japanese in that tongue. She says, I can't. Well, you were speaking in perfect Japanese and you were worshiping and praising God. My father would find this. He was raised in China, born in China, spoke perfect Mandarin. And he would find people when the time when the church would tarry after Sunday evening service, tarry by the hours, people would pray people through. If it took weeks, do you remember that time? You don't see it today. But people sometimes he would find that spoken perfect Mandarin Chinese. We could go on and on. The rivers of living water flow through me. 
and divine ecstasy filled my soul, she said. She became so weak with the greatness of heavenly visions that she staggered as she tried to walk across the floor, the room. You know, the power of God. Uh, again, I've seen this. Uh, you're so filled with the Holy Spirit that you can't walk. Sometimes you just, I remember just laying on the floor and, and crying and laughing and weeping and, and saying, God, I can't take anymore. But then you want him to continue to touch you. But if you take too much of God, you can't take the fullness of God. Our human bodies, I don't think, can handle it. And so he had to give me some rest because I loved it. But it was also uh, hurting at times because there was so much of God in me. Laughing, joy, unspeakable, anointing, beauty. I can't describe it. You've got to experience it. But when the exhaustion became very clear, Mrs. Simmons asked the Lord to strengthen me, which she did so sweetly, letting her rest and healing life possess my weary frame, helping me. In other words, we help one another. I remember in Jamaica, a 5,000-seat tent. The power of God came down. The blind would see, the lame would walk. i tell you what, I've never seen such a thing. Every single person I prayed for was healed. And I prayed by the hours. And the people with me, my team said, you got to quit, Dr. Hansen, you're going to die. Because virtue comes out of you. And I would say, I can't quit. Can you see? Everyone's being healed. I would kneel down. I said, pray for me. I'd get up and pray again. Kneel down, pray for me. That's the power of God. And that's what we're supposed to do. Be a team and help one another and see tremendous victories. Encourage one another and see God move across the United States. Passages from the Word of God came to me with precious new meaning. The covenant in Jesus became everything to Mary, Maria. She observed a multiplication of joy, the power to witness, teach, teachability, a hunger for the word, freedom of the midst of all care. She didn't care anymore about anything but Jesus. Didn't care what people said about her. Upon hearing about her spirit baptism experience, many other missionaries, evangelicals, all denominations all of a sudden wanted this experience. The power of a testimony. You and I need a testimony. Can you say amen? We need a testimony. We need to give a testimony of God's power across America. And that's why we're going to start Eagle Saving Nations. Go to my website, www.worldministries.org. www.worldministries.org. Sign up for Eagles Saving Nations. We need another great awakening. This is focused on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's focused on the power of God. Not what you and I can do. We have done nothing. He has done everything with his power. We can see a move of God across America like this nation hasn't seen for many years. We need another great awakening. May God richly bless you.